Good day, grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson, we're going to carry on with our lesson on acids and bases. So if you recall, we are speaking about strong acids versus weak acids and dilute versus concentrated. And we spoke about pH and we spoke about the fact that pH is a measurement of the concentration or the percent of hydrogen ions and pOH, so pH, equal minus the log of the hydrogen plus ions or hydronium ions and pOH equals minus the log of the hydroxyl ions um, and together they always have to become the same they have to add up to 10 to the minus 14 they have to add up to 10 to the minus 14 together so the whole point about this is to show you what it looks like so if you've got a very strong acid, then you're going to have a greater concentration of hydrogen plus ions. So there's going to be 1 times by 10 to the minus 1 um, hydrogen plus ions, whereas the hydroxyl ions is going to be 1 times by 10 to the um, minus 13. Now, I know that 13 is a bigger number, but this the way you write this is this would be written as 0,1 that is 0,1, whereas this is 0,1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. That's what that means, okay? So do you agree the concentration of the hydrogen plus ions is way bigger and, um, than the concentration of the hydroxyl ions? And therefore, we can say it's strongly acidic. If it's weakly acidic, then it's going to have a pH of 6. Okay, pH of 6 basically says that it is a very weak acid. 7 is neutral. Six, if it's a pH of 8, so it's bigger than 7, then it's weakly basic. And obviously, a pH of 13 is going to be a strong basic. Okay, so now that gives you an idea of your pH scale. So now we need to talk a little bit about KW because it kind of gives you an idea of where this pH scale came from and everything else. Water ionizes a very small amount. So if you have, and I explained this before, I think, if you've got a glass of water or, a, I don't know, a bottle of water, at all the time, spontaneously, the water molecules will break up into H3O plus ions and hydroxyl ions. But exactly the same amount, exactly the same time, you've got hydroxyl ions and hydronium ions, not necessarily the same ones, joining up to uh, rejoining or breaking up again to form two water molecules. So you have this happening all the time. So therefore, we can say that if the water is perfectly neutral, then there would be equal amounts of H3O plus and OH minus, right? However, if you what, look at your bottle of water, I'm just looking to see if I've got one, I don't. If you look at your bottle of water, very seldom does it have a pH of 7. It might have a pH of 5. Um, it very seldom has a pH bigger than, bigger than 7. The reason is that our systems are acidic. So we actually prefer, even though, okay, let me explain to you. Our stomach acid has got a pH of 1. Okay, so basically everything compared to our stomach acid is alkaline. Okay, so we don't want to put something with a pH of like 9 or 10 into our bodies because of the fact that that actually is going to give us a very bad reaction because our pH of the acid in our stomach is so high. So our bodies amazingly are actually work so that we prefer stuff that has a pH that is slightly lower. So for example, we might drink orange juice or apple juice or whatever, and it will have, or even the water that we like drinking, the bottled water we like drinking, tends to have a slightly acidic pH. So it will have a pH of about a five or a six. Very seldom is it perfectly neutral, which means that there's going to be a higher concentration of these H3O plus ions than there are of OH minus ions. Okay, so you can look at your bottles of water and you can see what your pH is, and from that you can tell how far this is ionized and what is winning, which one has got the highest concentration. Now, there are two definitions that you need to learn, it's very important. The one is autoprotolysis, and the other one is autoionization. 
Now, autoprotolysis is just the transfer of a proton between two of the same molecules. Okay, so it's a transfer of a proton between two of the same molecules. Autoanization is an example of autoprotolysis. So it's effectively the same thing, and all that they, they say this is because some textbooks are going to use autoionization, and some textbooks are going to say autoprotolysis. And both times they're talking about what is actually happening here with the water. That effectively, when two water molecules bounce against each other, there is going to be a spontaneous, well, there could possibly be a spontaneous transfer of a proton from one of the molecules to the other molecules, and that is called autoprotolysis or autoionization. Right, now, just to get you back into it, we can label the conjugate acid-base pairs. So we know that this has to be an acid and this has to be a base, right? If this is an acid, it's going to give its hydrogen away and then it's going to become a base, so it's going to become B1 which means that this has to be acid 2, which makes sense because if this was an acid, if we had a reverse reaction, then this would give away its hydrogen to become water. Okay, so this would be a base. And the reason I'm pointing this out to you is because we have spoken about the fact that you've got amphiprotic um, substances like water, which can act as both an acid and a base. Right, so let's talk about salt hydrolysis, okay? What you need to understand, and a lot of students struggle with this, so we need to talk about it a little bit, okay? When we do a titration, or we talk about neutralization of acids and bases, okay, we people naturally assume that if you take an acid and a base and we add them together, we're going to end up with a neutral substance, okay? So it's important to realize that if we're neutralizing something, it doesn't mean that the solution has a pH of 7. Okay, it doesn't. At the equivalence point of an acid-base neutralization reaction is a salt and the water. And the ions of the water interact with the salt present and form a small quantity of excess hydronium ions or hydroxyl ions. And at that point, the pH does not equal 7. So if you have a salt hydrolysis happening, in other words, an acid plus a base gives you salt plus water. But if that salt, which it should do, dissolves in the water, which it probably will because a salt is an ionic substance that dissolves in water, then what will happen is you'll end up with either an excess of hydronium ions or an excess of hydroxyl ions, depending on what the salt is. And then the pH does not equal seven, okay? So you need to understand that. So here are some of the rules that you need to understand, and it all has to do with the strength of the acids and bases as we work through it. So if you've got a strong acid and a strong base, or even a weak acid, plus a weak base, in other words, if they're the same strength, strong acid, strong base, weak acid, weak base, and you end up with a neutral salt plus water. Okay, your pH is going to be 7. So, for example, if you've got sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide, these are nice strong ones. Okay, you end up with sodium sulfate, sulfite, sulfate, sulfite. So, <laughs> sodium sulfite plus water. And that is a neutral salt. Okay, if you've got a weak acid and a strong base, you're going to end up with a weak basic salt. Okay, your salt is still going to be basic plus water, and your pH is going to be 9. So, for, well, that's an example. It's going to be higher than seven. Let's put it that way. So, for example, we've got hydrogen fluoride, which is a very weak acid, and we add it to a strong base, such as sodium hydroxide. You end up with sodium fluoride plus water, and the sodium fluoride is a very weak basic salt, okay, which means we're going to end up, and that's going to dissolve into this water, which means we're going to have a higher pH than seven. If we've got a strong acid and a weak base, so, for example, if we've got sulfuric acid and ammonia, you're going to end up with a weak acidic salt. So, for example, ammonium sulfate plus water, okay? And then the pH is going to be 5. And just going back, yeah, I didn't fill it in, but if you have a strong, a weak acid and a weak base, you're going to end up with a neutral salt and water again. So, for example, if you had HF, hydrogen fluoride plus ammonia, 
you're going to end up with nothing nice. You're going to end up with ammonium <laughs> um, fluoride plus you're going to end up with some water over there somewhere. Okay, a better example would be to add ethanoic acid to your ammonium. So let me just do that rather. So a better example would be to take um, ethanoic acid, CH3COOH, plus your ammonia, and you're going to end up with ammonium um, ethanoate, CH3COO, plus um, water. Okay, and that is going to be a neutral salt and water. Okay, right, so if you have a strong base and a strong acid, you end up with a neutral solution in seven. Same as if you've got a weak acid and a weak base. Okay, if they're the same, then you end up with a neutral solution of pH of seven. If you've got a weak acid and a strong base, you end up with a weak base and it's got a pH of nine. Or if you've got a strong acid and a weak base, you end up with a weak acid and a pH of less than seven. Okay. So let's talk about indicators. What's important for you to realize is that indicators are chemicals. A lot of people, and it sounds ridiculous for me to say it like that, but a lot of people don't realize that indicators actually play an important role. Okay, they don't just change color, because if you like it, they play a very important role. And you need to know how indicators work um, with respect to Le Chatelier's principle, and we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so indicators are chemical compounds that change color depending on whether they're in acidic or basic solution. That's all it is. A titration requires an indicator to respond to change in pH. Okay, so now if you look at this, yeah, this is an example of bromothermal blue. With bromothermal blue, you've got a hydrogen attached to the bromothermal blue, then you have color is yellow but it's in dynamic equilibrium with hydrogen plus ions plus bromothermal blue and then the color is blue so what you need to understand about this is if i for example put this in an acidic solution then what is going to happen is i'm going to increase the concentration of the hydrogen plus ions and by increasing the concentration of the hydrogen plus ions i effectively favor the reverse reaction and my indicator is going to turn yellow in color. If I ever, obviously, I am not in an acidic reaction, if I'm in a, hydro, um, a basic reaction, I will not have hydrogen plus ions, I'll have hydroxyl ions, which means that there'll be an increase in the hydroxyl ions, or there'll be a lack of hydrogen plus ions, which means that the reaction will favor the forward reaction to form hydrogen plus ions and the color will go blue. Okay, so you need to understand that. So if I had to say to you why when you put the, like, I might give you this equation and then say to you why when I place this in the acidic acid, so what color would this indicator go if I place it in acidic solution and why? Okay, so in that case, what I would say is placing it in an acid, placing it in an acid will turn it yellow. And then why? Because an acid will increase the concentration of the hydrogen plus ions. Then by Le Chatelier's principle, you need to say it, principle, an increase in concentration of the H plus ions will favor the reverse reaction in this case, therefore the indicator will turn yellow. Okay, you understand, I hope you do. It's very important because they love it. It's like a very popular question for them to, because indicators don't play a huge, huge role in the curriculum. Basically, the only other thing they can really ask you, which we will probably go through as well as question on it, is they will tell you that indicators are um, 
are sensitive to specific pHs, right? And they'll give you a table of that, and then they'll ask you to look at a titration, find out the final pH, and then ask you which indicator to, you should have used. Okay, so the other main question with the indicators is this, where they say to you which color would it go and why, and then you have to include the fact that you're talking about Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, so yeah, is the type of thing I was talking about. Um, Okay, so if you've got a strong acid and a strong base, the type of indicator you should use is bromothamol blue. Okay, now this is not what you need to know. This is what you need to know. This, the pH range and the indicators and the colors. Now, the nice thing about this is you don't actually have to learn it because they will give you a table like this. Unfortunately, we're pretty with all the colors. Okay, but they will give you a table with the pH range, and then they will might say to you, if we've got a strong acid and a strong base, which one are you going to use? If you've got a weak acid and a strong base, which are you going to use? And then you need to know your knowledge, understand, use your knowledge of acids and bases and what their final outcome is going to be as to which pH range to use. So for example, your strong acid plus strong base is going to end up giving you a neutral salt. Okay, so we end up with a pH range of 6 to 7.6. The preferred indicator is therefore bromothamol blue because it's sensitive in that area from 6 to 7.6. Okay, in acid, it's yellowy, orangey yellow in color. And at the end point, it's blue, but if it's in base, it is I mean green, but if it's in base, it's blue. Okay, so there's are the three colors. If you've got a weak acid in the strong base, then your pH range is going to be bigger than 7. So we're looking at about 8.3 to 10. That's the neutralization point. So what they have suggested you use is phenylphthalein. And you'll see it's colorless, okay, but the base it is pink and then with point, in other words, when you've reached the equivalence point, um, that is going to be faint pink. Now, now bromo crystal green, you guys don't really use that much, but we can use it as an example, okay? Um, where, in this case, because the pH range that it's sensitive in is so low, we'd use it for a strong acid and a weak base, okay? And then, obviously, the color would be yellow, green, and blue. There you go. So, obviously, there are a whole bunch of different indicators. Um, I mean, there's a standard universal indicator, which has a very wide pH range. So, it can be used for any of these, okay? Um, and then, obviously, your bromothermal blue, the phenylphthalein, um, methyl orange. All of those are different ways, that, different indicators that you can use, um, depending on the pH range. Just to point something out, if you've got a strong acid and a weak base, it is kind of useless to use bromothamol blue because the pH range that's going to change, the equivalence point for this thing, is going to be somewhere between 3.8 and 5.4. You have a pH an indicator which is sensitive to the pH range of 6 to 7.6. So they don't even overlap. So this is just going to stay, in fact, what would it be? It would be acidic. So therefore, it's going to stay yellow the whole time. This yellowy orange color, that's what it's going to do. Okay, and similarly, if you've got a strong acid in a weak base, you can't use bromocrystal green because it is going to just stay what would this be? This would be a strong acid, so it's neutral. So therefore, for it would be blue. So it would just say blue the whole time. So it would be useless to you. You need to find an, as an indicator that is sensitive in the range of the pH range that you should get for what you are using. Okay, so let's talk about titrations. Now, grade 12s, I'm pretty sure that titrations are part of, well, let's put it this way. One of the optional experiments that you should be able to do for your um, practicals is a titration. I know, however, that a lot of schools don't have the um, nice equipment to do a titration, um, but there are science centers around the country that help you with this. But saying that, um, I will show you a video in the next lesson, which will be tomorrow on how a titration is run, and I'll explain all the bits, bits and pieces. At the moment, all you need to know is that it's a method that we use to determine the concentration of a known substance using another standard solution. So if we've 
got a standard solution, we can use titration, which is a method um, of working out what the unknown substances concentration is. So in a titration, you've got a known volume of a standard solution is added to a known volume of a solution with unknown concentration and the concentrations can then be determined. So just let me bear with me for a second. Oh, there's no place to draw. Okay, so let me draw it. Oh, okay, good. Um, let me draw you quick draw for you quickly what it would look like and I will show you a proper picture tomorrow. So what you have is you have a retort stand which is really just a stand that is stuck into a base plate and on it you will have a clamp and then you'll have a long thin tube which goes down into a point and there's a tap there and then it goes into a point here. And over here, you'll have an Erlenmeyer flask. An Erlenmeyer, oh goodness. An Erlenmeyer flask looks like this. It's a triangular type flask. Okay, it looks like that. I really am going to show you a proper picture tomorrow, I promise. Okay, so then what happens is this here is used to measure. It's got a measurement all the way down. It's got measurements. This, by the way, is called a burette, sorry. I forgot that I hadn't told you that. So that's called a burette, okay? And what happens is generally is they will put um, one of the, well, they always put one of the solutions in here and one of the solutions in here. So say, for example, we have an acid with a known concentration. We could put it in here and we know the volume of the acid that we put in. Similarly, yeah, we put in the base of unknown concentration. Okay, and then what we do is we put our indicator in. So what our indicator might be, if this is an acid, so it might turn it to be orange, okay? And then what happens is I'll add the base. And as I add the base, I get closer and closer to a neutralization point. At the point that I get neutralization, at the end point, this color is going to change to green. And then what I do is I measure how much of the base I've added to the solution. So then I've got a whole bunch of information. I have got the concentration of the acid. Okay. I have the volume of the acid, right? I have the volume of the base that I added. Okay. And then what I do is I use the concentration is number of moles over volume equation to work out what the concentration of the base was using this. Okay, and I'm going to go through equations, questions with that you of that with you. Okay. So another so acid and bases are commonly used in titrations, and the point of neutralization is called the end point. So at that point, the acids and bases have reached an end point. And another name for titration is volumetric analysis. So what we're going to do now, Sorry guys, for some reason I lost you for a few seconds. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to um, go through a calculation of how we would work out the known unknown concentration, okay? And then what we'll do is, and I think that's probably what we'll do for today, um, there's this one and then there are a couple of exam questions, we'll see how it goes. And then what we'll do is Tomorrow, like I said, I'll show you a video of what a titration is and we go through a whole bunch of calculations, typical titration calculations, because it is quite a tricky con concept. I don't know what happened.
There you are, you're back. Okay, so it says, given that sodium hydroxide plus HCl gives you sodium chloride plus water, it says 25 cubic centimeters of the sodium hydroxide solution was pipetted into a conical flask. Okay, and titrated with 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed concentration of hydrochloric acid. Okay, using a suitable indicator, it was found that 15 cubic centimeters of acid was needed to neutralize the base. Okay, calculate the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. So they've got, okay, so we've got 25 cubic centimeters, 25 cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide. Just a second. Yeah, no, I'm right. So it's on wait. 25 centimeters of cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide. We also know that it was perpetuated against a 0 0,2 decimeter moles per decimeter cube concentration, and that we used 15 cubic centimeters of the acid. So first it says make sure that the equation is balanced. Okay. So we've got Na, well, let's write it out again, NaOH plus HCl goes to NaCl plus H2O, and I think it's balanced, but let's check, one sodium, one sodium, one chlorine, one chlorine, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, one oxygen, one oxygen, yay, it's balanced, tick. Next, it says write down all the information you know about the reaction, convert into the correct units. Okay, so let's do that and i'll show you the fast way of doing this afterwards so we got the sodium hydroxide let's talk about sodium hydroxide versus hcl okay the sodium hydroxide we've got 25 cubic centimeters but remember we have to divide that by a thousand to get it into decimeters cubed so remember 25 divided by it doesn't want to do it divided by one one two three equals equals and then obviously it's 0, 025. So that's the volume is 0, 025. The volume of HCl was used as 0, 015 decimeters cubed. Okay. We also know the concentration of the HCl is 0, 02. Okay, so that's what we know. Do you agree that we can say we can calculate the number of moles of HCl that are added because we know that con concentration is number of moles over volume. Therefore, concentration multiplied by volume equals the number of moles. Therefore, N is going to be, let's use our calculator again, let's try and find it. So we've got 0 0.2, 0 0.2 multiplied by 0.015 equals 0.003, So we use 0.003 moles of HCl. Okay. Now it says calculate the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Okay. So do you agree the ratio is one to one? One mole of sodium hydroxide reacted with one mole of hydrochloric acid to give you one mole of sodium chloride and one mole of water. Okay. So the ratio is one to one, which means the number of moles of sodium hydroxide in the reaction is 0, 0, 0, 3. Finally, it says calculate the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. Okay. Well, that's pretty easy. We can say, well, N is, okay, let's try again. Concentration is number of moles over volume. We know the number of moles. It is 0, 0, 0, 3. And we know the volume. It's 0, 0, 0, 0.025. So we can pop that in our calculator. So we can divide by 0, 0, 0.025. And we end up with 0.12. So the concentration of this is 0.12 moles per decimeter cubed. Okay, now grade 12, that is a very good way of doing this. And it's obviously um, it's obviously a very good way to do it for step by step by step. There is a shortcut which I'm going to just show you, and I want to talk to you through the shortcut. Okay, and it is actually on the formula sheet, the shortcut, okay. Um, I'm pretty sure it is. I just want to check quickly. Um, yes, it is. It's quite nice. 
Okay, um, it says CAVA over CBVB is equal to NA over NB. Okay, that's the shortcut. So let me talk you through it. Okay, we know that, and we've already actually used this, the number of moles are for the acid is equal to the concentration of the acid multiplied by the volume of the acid. Okay, the number of moles for the base is equal to the concentration of the base and the volume of the base. So therefore, it's very easy to say that, see that Na over Nb is going to be the same as CAVA over CVVB. Okay, so now, that's easy, okay? So therefore, we can see that this ratio is 1 to 1. So the Na over Nb is just whatever this ratio is, and it happens to be 1 to 1. So we say 1 over 1 is equal to the concentration of the acid, which we got told was 0, 0,2, multiplied by the volume of the acid. Now, do you see that the reason this is cool is that you don't actually have to convert anything as long as these are the same units. This is 25 cubic centimeters and this is 15 cubic centimeters. We don't actually have to change anything because their units get canceled. So the volume of the acid was 15 over the volume of the hydroxide was 25 and we want to know the concentration of the base. Okay, so therefore do you agree that the concentration of the base or alkaline is going to be 0, 0,2 multiplied by 15 divided by 25 and then if I get my calculator out I get 0, 0.2 multiplied by 15 equals divided by 25 equals, and you get exactly the same answer, 0, 0,12. So the concentration of the NaOH is equal to 0, 0,12 moles per decimeter cube. Now grade 12, it really doesn't matter to me which one you do. It doesn't matter to me whether you do the first method or the second method. What matters to me is that you get it right. Obviously the first method requires, I mean, is expecting you to use the fact that you understand every step as you go along. The second method is more like a um, where you just learned the method and you know what to substitute in. And it is prone, there are some places where you can make errors. So either way, I'm very happy with whichever one you choose to do as long as you know what you're doing. Okay, so now let's do an exam question example. Okay, it says in an acid base titration, 50 cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide and 0 0.2 of 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide solution was placed in a and a few drops were indicated. The burette was filled with sulfuric acid of unknown concentration. Okay, so this is the concentration we're trying to find eventually, right? It says the experiment is repeated three times and the following results were obtained, 20.2, 19.8, and 20. It says define the term endpoint of a titration. So the endpoint of a titration is obviously the point at which the indicator changes color, right? Makes sense, okay? Sulfuric acid is a diprotic acid. Explain what, it, what the term diprotic. Diprotic means that sulfuric acid can give away all of its hydrogens. It's going to give away two hydrogens, and therefore it is a diprotic acid. Explain why sulfuric acid is a strong acid because it completely ionizations or, or it dissociates completely. Then it says, calculate the average volume of the sulfuric acid used for the titration. Well, that's pretty easy. We're going to go 20, 2 plus 19, 8 plus 20 divided by 3. Okay, so let's do that. So do you see there were three, three very easy marks to be got because, in fact, this is also easy, but three very easy questions where you could get the marks simply if you knew your theory. Okay, so let's carry on. We've got 20.2 plus 19, it's going to be 20, 0.8 plus 20 equals, yeah, it's going to be 20. So therefore, the average is 20 moles per decimeter cubed, so, I mean, uh, the centimeters cubed. So the average is 20 centimeters cubed. Now let's calculate the concentration of the sulfuric acid. Okay, so let's look at the, first things first, you always do make sure that it's balanced. So it's two hydrogens here, plus another one is 
two is four, and there is four hydrogens, one sulfur here and one sulfur there. Um, four, five, six oxygens, four, five, six oxygens. Um, two sodiums, two sodiums. Yeah, we've sorted. So it's definitely balanced, okay? So if we do the shortcut, we've got Na is equal to CAVA over NB equals CBVB. Okay, so this is the ratio of the number of moles to acids to base. So therefore, it's going to be 1 over 2 is equal to the concentration of the acid is what we want. H2SO4 multiplied by the volume of the acid, which we worked out to be 20, all over the concentration and volume of the sodium hydroxide. So that's going to be 0, 0,2 times by 50. Okay, so therefore we can say it's one half multiplied by 0, 0,2 multiplied by 50 divided by 20 is going to give me the concentration of H2SO4. So let's get out our calculator and work that out. So it's going to be 0 0.5 times 0 0.2 times 50 equals divided by 20 equals so it's 0, 0.25. So the concentration of H2SO4 is equal to 0, 0.25 moles per decimeter cubed. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, now. Let's have a look at this question. Okay, it's a little bit different. We're now looking at pHs. It says the balanced chemical equation for the self-ionization of water is 2H2O goes to H3O plus plus OH minus and delta H is greater than naught, which means it's endothermic. Endothermic. It says at 25 degrees Celsius, dissociation constant Kc for this reaction is 10 to negative 14 and the pH is 7. First, it says explain why water is classed as an amphalite. Okay, remember what an amphalite is? An amphalite is a substance that can act as both an acid and a base. Acid and a base. Okay, now it says write down the concentration of the hydroxide ions at O for O7 at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, they've told us the pH is 7. And they've told us that Kc for this reaction is 10 to the minus 14. So we know that pH equals the con minus the log of the H plus ions. But we also know that pOH is equal to minus the log of the hydroxyl ions. Okay. And they tell us the pH is 7. But do you agree that the scales goes to 14? So if the pH is 7, what's the pOH? The pOH has to be 14 minus the pH. So therefore, it's also going to be 7. So it's 7 is equal to minus the log of the concentration of the hydroxyl ions. So then all I need to do is solve this, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to go... How do I do this again? Oh, yes. So I go, uh, where's my log? There it is. So I'm going to go 10. No, no, not log. Shift log to the negative 7 equals. Oh, okay. And then we're going to go shift mode. And we're going to go 7, 7, and we're going to go 3, and then we're going to go SD, and it's 1 times by 10 to the minus 7. So the concentration of the OH minus ions is going to be 1 times by 10 to the negative 7, okay? Moles per decimeter cubed. Right, this is write an equation for the dissociation constant Kw for the above. Okay, now Kw is exactly written out the same as Kc and everything else. So you've got the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. But remember what's important about Kcs and Kws and Kas and Kbs is that we do not include liquids or 
solids. Okay, so therefore we have the concentration of H3O plus multiplied by the concentration of OH minus. Okay, grade 12, that's it for today. We will continue with acid and bases and learning more about titrations and answering questions from the acid and base section tomorrow. Have a great evening. Cheers. And remember our lesson tomorrow is at four o'clock. Cheers.